What's up, everybody? Welcome to the Bronx Pinstripe Show. We have a lot to talk about, believe it or not, today. We were going to do a little segment where we argue one side or the other for some impending free agents that the Yankees will be uh, potentially in on this offseason. But instead, we got some news. Scott, we got news this week. Well, first of all, before you even get to any news, don't bury the most important piece here. The Yankees, uh, they're playing right now. We're actually recording during the game. Um, but they won a series. Is that the most important piece? I'm just saying they won a series. Okay. First time. First it's been time a long time. Play. It's been a long two time. Two full months of baseball. Have two not won full a months before they've won a series. Yeah. You know, like, why don't they just listen to John Sterling and win the series? Because that's how you become a good baseball team. That's how you get to the, that's how you get to the, the promise line. You got to win series. You just got to well, win you, the series. First, first, you have to score more runs than your opponent. Well, that's, and that's been a challenge. That has been a challenge. That has been a challenge. Giving up less runs also challenge. So you're right. They, they're they beating up on the Tigers. How many people do you think are paying attention to this series or to this team right now at this point? Well, I think that this is going to renew some interest with a little bit of a, a, a win, a uh, little bit of a win streak here, which has been a far cry from what, what's what been happening for the last two months. They have what we're going to be talking about are the kids coming up. And that's something that's that we've what's been renewing interest. Them Absolutely. playing baseball, winning games against the Tigers yeah. does not matter at this point. This team's not making the postseason, but the fact that we've got Jason Dominguez yes. and Austin Wells coming yes. up and there's a lot of waiver, waiver news, lots of waiver activity, Harrison Bader, all of that stuff is very, very interesting. <laughs> and, and Dominguez is obviously the lead. The Martians coming up. I think this is unexpected. I'm extremely happy they're oh, doing oh, it. Oh, 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 excuse me. Hold on a second. Okay, I know you did your bold prediction, but I'm oh, talking yeah, yeah, about yeah. Like give it, give it to me. Seven days ago, give it we had reporters me. saying, "Didn't Jack Curry, who's pretty close to the most inside guy, like as far as reporters go, like he gets his information from the source?" I think Jack Curry originally reported he does not expect Dominguez to be called up this season. Well, I guess uh, I guess I should take Jack Curry's seat then because uh, this is something that that yes. I saw and I want my goddamn flowers. You just throw okay? shit against the wall. No, 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 no. Uh, you know what? This was called logical deduction. We have a bunch of shitty outfielders. There's a really good kid who's coming up through. Maybe he'll catch fire and actually be that right player. And then the Yankees will use common sense, knocking back to the common sense department, and bring up the talent to to actually play and get a get a taste of the stage. Where I was wrong was I thought the Yankees would actually be in somewhat contention. But no, they're worse than anybody you know what the expected. ironic thing is if this team was in contention we he would not, not be, be there his, <laughs> we would not be seeing dominguez called up the only reason he's called up is because the team is out of it and i'm glad that they're like okay let's get this kid's feet wet right it's yeah. not like our development system is anything special in the minors like having him get more more at bats in triple a what the hell is that going to do for the kid no let him get at bats at the major league level Maybe he'll go through some struggles. Maybe he'll he'll have a hot you know month of September. Who cares? Let him. Play it kind of doesn't matter. That's every single. Of course, it does not matter. It kind of doesn't matter. Thing. I mean, for the for the player itself as well, because there's a lot of people who are gonna say, "Why are you rushing the kid? Why are you bringing him up too early?" This he was in double. The kid. He was in double not... A two two weeks ago. It's it's not rushing him. It it doesn't matter. This is furthering developing him at a, at the highest level where right. he's gonna get a lot of strikes thrown. He's gonna have, in theory, the the best people teaching him what to do. And guess what? He's going to be able to see what it's like, feel what it's like, and then have an entire off season to make any adjustments that he believes and the coaching staff believes are necessary for him to then walk into a full season, which he's going to be starting now in, in right. spring training, uh, opening day. Dominguez is going to be the center fielder, most likely, uh, make adjustments in the off season. And that right there to me is extremely invaluable. And that's that, that, that goes like when you look at development, you can't possibly develop better than this situation that he's in, honestly. Right, because if the Yankees were in a were in a playoff race right now, then Dominguez's struggles or successes would have consequences beyond just his own personal development. And yes. so he would not be here. And then you could make a case where why are you rushing a 20-year-old that has barely had time in AAA when you're vying for a playoff spot? But right. that's not the case. Like you all, like you just said, you're just getting him reps at the major league level, so he doesn't have to worry about that next spring training. All he's going to have to worry about heading into next spring training is being in shape, doing the right work, and playing well. That's it. He, he's the job is his, and that's all he needs to worry about. And I well, think that I don't, can go. A I'm long not going to go. I don't think we should go that far because that really does take away the uh, or you know 
I mean, it's, it's, it's part of the course with the accountability piece that we've been talking about, but, but I, I don't want him to think that. But with well, Volpe and Peraza this winter going into the spring, there was that competition and, and Volpe clearly won, right? Like, but so the, there's, who would Dominguez even be competing with? Yeah. And a, an impending free, a free agent that, or a trade or something along those lines, but you're, you're not wrong in that way, in that regard. The job is going to be his unless he completely tanks on something and something bad uh, he does, you know, doesn't happen or whatever. But the adjustments, the, the other thing is, is uh, what you didn't mention is like, he's going to have to go through, just play baseball, but he's going to learn so much for himself yeah. development wise and, and mechanically. And like, just, just to get the feel. Do you remember when I think who was it? Uh, was a Jeter that was talking about this in, in the documentary about them coming up in 95 at the end of the year, granted, very different scenario. That was a good team going through what was a playoff run, but the, the things that they took from it, the being up in the bigs that with, with the rest of the guys, different situation. I understand that, but the fact that these guys have the ability to go up and they will be playing, they will be playing under a circumstance where there is no pressure. There really is no pressure for them. They I'm sure will put their own pressure on themselves, but there really is no pressure for them to do things. They just got to go out there, have fun and play baseball. So yes, it does go back to that 16 season in the sense where there's nothing to lose. You just play dumb and hungry. And that's, and that's, that's what we want from the kids. Like you don't know any better. You just go out there and, and play well. And, when that did happen in 16, and granted, I've said, I don't think this is the same type of class that we have coming up, but um, they played really well and started winning games. And it was they fun. Did. It, well, it, it's <laughs> Gary Sanchez was a big reason for, for them winning games. Absolutely. That, that, uh, that stretch. Logan, can you pull up Aaron Judge's stats in 2016? Because I want to say he struck out close to 50% of the it time. It was a 50% clip. It was. And then he got injured, right? Because he finished that year on the injured list. Yeah. Revamped everything in the offseason, came back a new player. Because he even went into that 2017 season not as the starting outfield, not as the starting right fielder. He won that job in spring training. I think he was batting eighth on opening day. A week and a half later, he's hitting cleanup for the Yankees, and then he eventually got moved to the to the number two spot. But I mean, that that's yeah. the... That's the ideal example of some a kid coming up with all the fanfare, all the uh, you know accolades of being a prospect, and all the expectations completely sucking because he struck out a ton, and then identifying that and having the luxury to have that sample size within the major leagues, uh, so that you could make some adjustments in the off season. And he did exactly that. So it, it just proves that even if you do badly or poorly. You can you can really use that to your benefit as a young player, Logan. Um, he struck out at a forty four percent clip, and then yeah. went into in in uh, only twenty seven games though. And he, I mean, he hit one seventy nine. He had a sixty two WRC plus. He was bad. Um, and then he went into spring training battling Hicks for right field. <laughs> they made Hicks the fourth outfielder, and then he ended up as the center fielder because Ellsbury stunk. Ellsbury was hurt, I guess. Then, yeah, but then Ellsbury wound his way back into the wild card lineup <laughs> that, DH, that, that yeah, starting DH, DH in the wild card game, the wild card game. so uh Dominguez you know just to run down some of his numbers eight games at AAA this year obviously small sample size hitting 444 in 117 minor league games combined this year hitting 266 with 377 on base 425 slugging that's good for an 801 OPS switch hitter He's he's uh, he's a bit of a meatball out there. If you got if you have not seen the tape on him, he's short and stocky. He looks five thick. nine. He looks, he looks like a running back, just like. And have you seen like the helicopter? He's got his his follow through. He's got a little bit of a helicopter, which is old school, but typically seen from a left handed swing. But he also has it on his right handed swing. So it's it's kind of something like oh, I haven't seen that in a while. Yeah, and those splits don't even really tell the story too, because that's including all of the the minor league uh, the minor league stats beyond just the triple A. Because the second the second half of him being a double A, I mean, he's, he's been he, mashing the last the, month of double yep. A. He's been absolutely mashing. So, if you really want to get more of an idea of of what the adjustments he's made, you got to look at the the sample size that's a little bit you know further um, further along in double A, and. That's it, man. Like he's got, he's showing the ability to make adjustments when adversity hits him. And honestly, when I see a young player doing that, that is the number one thing I'm looking for. Can you make the adjustments? Can you rise your, uh, raise your level of play to, uh, to, to what you're now facing in, in better competition? And he's been able to do that. So 
That's he, really, really encouraging. He is 20. He will be 21 in on February 7th of next year. So he will turn 21 in spring training next year. Is this the youngest player the Yankees have had on the major league roster? In like probably in decades. Just about every. I mean, if it wants to make, if you guys want to feel a little old, he is yeah, um, just it. two, just two weeks older than me. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I'm getting to that point, I guess. Yeah, yeah. There was a player in the '80s I saw somewhere that uh, that was a, a little bit younger than him, but no, he's he's right there with the with the youngest. So, man, I love it. I'm. I'm I love the fact that 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 he is going to be up and and we're going to be able to see him on the biggest stage. It's going to be so much fun to can you imagine his f- frame of mind from, you know, coming where we couldn't see anything but like grainy film of him working out and and like doing all this random shit not very not long ago, 2 years ago, and now he's he's progressed through the system faster than has he been fa- I mean, faster than anybody really i i greg bird i know came up from double a at one point but I, from as, as far as position players go he he from where he was given his age to where he is currently probably the fastest rising guy that's ever come through the system and it's kind of been gary a little... sanchez was in the minor leagues for 19 years <laughs> it's uh so for dominguez the interesting thing is when he first was signed by the Yankees, they used all of their signing pool money to sign him. Immediately, he was a higher ranked prospect than he is now. So he his prospect rankings has has actually gone down every year he's been in the system. That doesn't necessarily mean he has gotten you know worse. It's just because you're being graded against everyone else in the minors, right? So there could have been an influx of talent that just graded higher than him. But his rise. There was also a lot of speculation around him. Not necessarily. <laughs> there wasn't any game tape, so they were going yeah, off that, of. That's all taken into account. I remember we way back. Um, we talked to Jim Callis. Jim Callis does rankings for MLB Pipeline. I don't know if he still does, but he talked about how the rankings are done, and part of it is a uh, an un- they do factor in the unknown. The more unknowns there are, the the lower you're automatically going to be ranked because there's just there's more of a variance on on what you might become i don't quite understand that though because he was he was up there you know with top prospects and they we knew nobody knew anything about him well the only thing they knew about him was all of the scouting from the from workouts not real games yeah yeah i mean Bat to ball skills, right? Like like bat speed, all all how the again, ball it's all showcasing. That all, it, it was yeah. all it was all via showcase rather than actual game play at all. And that's and that's where I think a lot of it went down because they saw they started to see you know flaws in his game because of course he was 18 years old uh, in 2021. Logan just put in here he made his uh, made his minor league debut. Of course, you're going to see these these things. First of all, this is a this is a kid that's coming from. Uh, a different country at 18 years old and, and being, you know, placed in the, in the minor league system of, of uh, in the United States, like that alone, culture shock, very different, you know, just, just on its, on the surface level, that is extremely different. And then you got to go and play baseball against the best people you've ever played against. Um, And then continue to, to improve yourself, understand that, you know, that you're going to have to do things differently, getting into new habits. Like oh, there's a lot of things that he has made adjustments on, not just his baseball game, but life um, and been able to fly through this. So to me, that just means he's oozing with talent and has the ability to make the changes, which is exciting. Have they given him a number yet? Do we know if he's, he's been assigned a number at this point? Curious if they give him like a bullshit number this year and then next year he'll get a real number. Or if they're just going to give him a real number off the bat. Yeah, I doubt that they've announced any numbers because the transaction hasn't. It won't happen until tomorrow, right? I mean, his spring training number. I think what was it? Probably I could get it. I don't remember. Right. I think it was like ninety three. <laughs> yeah, so that's not a real number. But if you want to go see Jason Dominguez in the next homestand, you should definitely use Game Time to get your tickets. Game Time is our preferred ticketing app because it is the easiest way to buy tickets to whatever you want to go to: sporting events, concerts, comedy shows, theater, and much, much more. 
The app has so many cool features and is very easy to use. It gives you, uh, tells you about flash deals and trending tickets, and you can make informed purchases. And there's also event cancellation protection so you can buy with confidence. I love using the app because it's a very fast buying process. You'll also get the images of your seats so you know exactly what to expect. And that's also huge if you've never been to that venue before. And the tickets then go directly to your phone so you don't have to dig through your email to find them. You can snag tickets today without stress using game time. Download the app, create an account, and use code BRONX for $20 off your first purchase. Once again, download the GameTime app and use our promo code BRONX for $20 off your first purchase. Also, Austin Wells coming up uh, for uh, September 1st in 31 games at AAA level this year. He's hitting 263, 353, 475 with an 828 OPS, and then total in the minors this year, 94 games. He's got a 783 OPS um, probably looking at him long-term out of the catching position first. That's base, not what they're saying long-term. now though. They're not saying that now they're, they're definitely coming back on that to, and which makes sense this year, right? They're going to see what it is, but I don't know if they can actually, even if they believe it, I don't know if they can actually say it right now until they get more, uh, get some eyes on him a little bit more in the major leagues. But that was, that was the the narrative for a long time was that he's not going to be a catcher for the long, the, the long term. Um, but specifically recently Boone's been saying, yeah, he's got the potential. We think he could stay at the position. You're, you're, you're I'm just hoping he doesn't stay at the position to make that decision. <laughs> you're, you're listening. You're listening to what Aaron. I'm Boone just telling you what's say. I'm just telling you what's being said. Just telling you what's being said. <laughs> you think they're giving Aaron Boone all the correct information at this point? Or are they, are they giving him a uh, false? I don't think Aaron Boone knows what to do with information when it comes to him. So whether it's correct or not correct, I don't think it matters. Well, now's probably a good time to talk about uh, the future of Aaron Boone. So there's been a couple of, a lot of reports over the past week or so, uh, speculation, I will call it. So what was it five days ago, Andy Martino reported, I'm using in air quotes, that the Yankees are not moving on from Aaron Boone. His report was basically uh, based on precedent, that it is unprecedented for the Yankees to fire a manager before His contract is up and go over. It would be going, Hal would be going over Brian Cashman's head in order to make that decision because Aaron Boone has one more left year left on his deal. And Brian Cashman just signed a new contract. Was that last off season? He just signed a new, a new contract. Um, Right. Yes. So, so it's unprecedented under the Brian Cashman Yankees for them to fire managers. They don't rehire managers. Joe Torrey, not rehired. Joe Girardi, not rehired. There's semantics, but there's a slight difference here. But then you dropped an article, Scott, in our chat, Bob Clappish, who, again, like, get it, like this guy wrote essentially an autobiography of Brian Cashman. Like, he, like I don't even know that thing should have said uh, by Brian Cashman with a you know ghost writing of of Bob Clappish that Hal's upset, and it's uh, not out of the question that he would go over Brian Cashman's head to say, you need to make a change at manager because we are extremely disappointed with, uh, with the results this season, tisk tisk, find a new, a new manager. I, I think the context is important for why he's saying that also in the, uh, in the article referencing the situation in 17, when Cashman was, you know, going to Hal uh, with a recommendation to not reinstate uh, Joe Girardi and to go a younger path with uh, with Aaron Boone, and he how supported Cashman in that regard, and what has happened since then. So I think the fact that the the most recent um, the most recent instance of this happening is correlating with the downturn of this team absolutely should be in 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 the forefront of Hal Steinbrenner's mind with how he moves forward, and you know whether it's it's with. Just Brian Cashman, just Aaron Boone. I don't know, but he needs to, that needs to be a very significant factor in what he is, uh, is looking at. So all, all things are pointing from what Clappish is saying is that Hal at this point does not feel like he's got to just back Cashman uh, because of, of, you know, the history of where they are. And I think in 17, that was the case. So whether um, that's true or not is a totally different story. Who knows? 
Is it bothering you at all that these reporters are acting like they're reporting news when really all they're doing is making informed speculation? Like, I mean, that, that's all the, that's all Martino not was me. like, it's not bothering okay, me because that's, that is what it bit. is. But, but these, because these reporters, I know their job isn't just, <coughs> excuse me. I if know it were job news, if just, it were news, we would know it. It's not news. It's speculation. Yeah, but it's not, it's not framed as speculation. And and I get why they do that. They do it because they want clicks on their articles. And of course, these guys are insiders. They ha- they are making informed guesses. B- they, they basically, Andy Martino does not think Boone is going anywhere because of X, Y, and Z. And Bob Clappish is saying, no, it's not out of the question that Aaron Boone could be fired because of X, Y, Z. All they're doing is using the information they've obtained from sources to make guesses. But this is not... Because I, some people sent me um, the uh, Andy Martino report that's just like, oh, Boone's not going anywhere. And then you dropped in like, oh, Boone's getting fired. So it's just like – Here, let me, let me read one, this. One thing let or me, the other. Let, let me read this because there, there's also you know referencing Cashman and, and the decisions on Donaldson, Joey Gallo, Frankie Montas, Aaron Hicks, um, and all of the – you know, it's also referencing the like, Yankee analysts on the hot seat, player development staff, well, why did international he use scouting. Donaldson? Hold on. Why did he use Donaldson as like the, 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 the article? What was the headline of the article? It was confusing where it's like Donaldson being released does not uh, calls into question. How Yankees release of Josh Donaldson could impact Boone's yeah. job security. What? Yeah, it's because of the, the they're they're dumping him and basically calling it a mistake even before the season's well, over. Well, yeah, okay. Know. So basically, what Clapish is saying in that article is that Hal understands all of the mistakes that Cashman yeah. has made. Most let me continue notably, to read before you. Josh Donaldson. Let me, let me continue to read. Contrary to the belief of the bo- boss haters on social media, I'm told the owner is deeply upset. <laughs> I love that, and that's in quotes. Deeply upset at the franchise's downward downward spiral. The young boss plans to hold everyone accountable once the regular season ends. And that's where manager Aaron Boone comes in. I heard weeks ago the manager would be in trouble if the Yankees were to finish in last place. That door, I'm told, is still wide open. But the other day, SNY's Andy Martito reported that Boone is safe. He has Cashman's blessing. The only way Boone would be fired is if Steinbrenner pulled rank on his GM. And that's where the difference that's where the difference is in thought is that is that he is actually in a place where he might pull rank on him, whereas Martino doesn't believe based on precedent that that will happen. That's where I think the biggest distinguishing difference is in, in how these things are reported. And I understand that it makes sense. What Martino is talking about is precedent, which is very important with the New York Yankees because they they seem to use it all the time. Um, and Clappish is now saying, well, maybe not. Maybe maybe precedent in this instance is not going to be upheld because of the unprecedented last place finish, downward spiral, and all of the events that have transpired over the last few months. So if the Yankees somehow like go on a little bit of a run in, in meaningless games this month and finish in fourth place, that means Boone is safe, right? Like it has to be the basement and complete yeah. embarrassment yeah, it's, for Aaron it's, Boone to be fired? It's, it's, uh, it's dumb optics at that point, for sure. Well then, but, but that's just, that's silly. Like I'm not buying that. But again, like we don't know if that's the hard line. That's, that's the, that's the thought. Right. Because at that point is, here's what I, I, whoever. How Steinbrenner's not looking at the total and be like, God damn it. Now I can't do anything. No, because I'm sure whoever told that to Bob Clappish a few weeks ago was saying that because they didn't believe the Yankees would actually finish in last place. Probably. So instead of, instead of saying, no, there's no way Boone is getting fired. They said, yeah, he might get fired if this happens, saying something they didn't think was going to ever happen. That's possible. But yeah. now there's a very real chance they finish in last place. Yes. Very real chance. You can't, I mean, look, you get, you get things like when, when the Tampa Bay Rays are talking about you in a post game after a scuffle saying that, you know what, we just got to have cooler heads or I'm paraphrasing here. It's it's not uh, at the end of the day. This is a team competing for a playoff position and a last place team. That headline went bonkers. You know, it went it went everywhere. Uh, that that made national headlines because you're talking about the New York Yankees as a last place team in the same frame of reference in the same conversation as playoffs, and that doesn't happen. And yeah, that's got to be fucking embarrassing. That's got to be embarrassing. 
And frankly, we've been talking about this being an embarrassment for a few months now. And if they don't own that and identify that as an embarrassment and then make changes because of said embarrassment, I don't know where, I don't know what's happening. Right. And so whether the Yankees finish in last place or fourth place does not matter because the reality is they were in last place at a point in the season where the season was essentially over for them. So Correct. that's, that's all that you need to know. And the only thing that would uh, finish in fourth place, the only thing that would do is 25 years from now, when you're looking up and down the Yankees history on baseball reference, you won't see a last place finish in 2023, right? Like that's the only thing that's going to do for them is that, oh, it's X number of your run of not finishing in last place for the Yankees. Well, and also you're looking at this team right now. Okay. It's uh hold on. It's, it was, it's, it's one, nothing. It's uh three, nothing Detroit. Um, and it's in the sixth inning. If they if they lose this game, this is where this is the line in the sand for the team that has been playing all year long, and then tomorrow a different team. Basically, you know when you know Harrison Bader, who we we're, we're, we're going to get to the waiver um, claims, but there's a different team coming tomorrow. So what does that actually tell you? If that team finishes in fourth place or last place, what does that even mean when you're talking about Aaron Boone at that point? This is not his team essentially. This is just a bunch of kids that have come up and oh, are, but what are, if? are doing something. But who have been if, playing very well. What if Wells and Dominguez play well in September, give this team a yeah. little bit, bit of a spark, and they, they play some good baseball for the last month? I'm glad you and brought then, that up, Andrew. Hold on. And then all we hear about is, oh, Aaron Boone really was re able to relate to, to the mm. young kids that were called up. And yeah, yeah, we yeah. want his mentorship there for next year when we're really going for it. Uh -huh. I'm glad you brought that up. Because if that were the case, Joe Girardi would still have been the manager after 2016, 2017, when he got the most out of this young core who has shown nothing but but uh, a slide down under the same guy that we're talking about, Aaron Boone. So we want to talk about precedent. Precedent's not there. Joe Girardi had some success. Aaron Boone has had not, not had not has not had its success. So there's nothing there to point to besides the fact that guess what? Maybe these kids are just talented. If that if that is what happens, so. Yeah, the very opposite could happen too. Is if they come up and struggle. <laughs> <laughs> well, did I say last? Was this? Did I say this on air or not? That Dominguez and Wells, you know, showing something could actually, you know, make people make fans a little bit happier with Cashman this year going into the off season because they could say like, oh, at least he's developing some young talent, and then there's something to look forward to for next year. Whereas I'm not going to feel this way because. I hope I can be a little bit more logical than this, but if, you know, if Jason Dominguez strikes out 44% of the time, like Aaron judge did in 2016, that doesn't mean his career is over. It's just, it's one month of his first month in the big leagues. But if he hits 350 with seven home runs and 10 doubles, it's the Gary Sanchez, Aaron judge relationship. This is exactly yeah. what happened. And look what happened after that. One guy went up, one guy went down. Yeah. And they were, they were, they were opposites uh, in that first, you know, month and a half stint. Gary Sanchez looked like Babe Ruth. Uh, and then, you know, granted he, he did have good he made offensive all stars. Years. He, he was, an yeah, he had good offensive years. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not taking that away, but trajectory wise. And you look at the, the, you know, five, six year span of how they're playing. One guy, one guy is significantly better. And actually the other guy that didn't do well, just went somewhere else. And Oh, by the way, is actually playing decently. All right. Well, I want to talk about all the waiver madness, but first AG one is all of your key health products rolled up into one delicious beverage. AG one is loaded with 75 high quality vitamins, minerals, whole food sourced ingredients, probiotics, and adaptogens. It promotes gut health with pre and probiotics. It also gives you better sleep quality and recovery and allows you to focus throughout the day with no crashes because AG1 contains less than one gram of sugar, no GMOs, no nasty chemicals or artificial flavoring. The best part is they make it very easy to build into your routine because it's delivered directly to your door on a monthly basis. They send you a nice little bottle and a storage container and a scoop so you feel fancy like mixing that thing up in the morning. Each serving costs less than three bucks and all you have to do is add some water and boom, you are done. You are ready to start your day. To try it for yourself, go to drinkag1.com slash pinstripes for a free one-year supply of immune-supporting vitamin D and five free travel packs. That five, that um, travel packs, those are great, but also that vitamin D will come in clutch as the uh, the winter months are coming and you're not going to be out in the sun as much. Again, drinkag1.com slash pinstripes. Thank you to Athletic Greens. Okay, so 
We were talking about this before we started recording. So the news is obviously Harrison Bader was put on waivers by the Yankees and claimed by the Cincinnati Reds. That quote uh, of Bader when they asked him what his reaction was to the, to him being on waivers and, and he was like, "What does that mean? Like, what does that mean for me?" Yeah. Right? Like, just not great. Like, maybe maybe talk to the player. Right? Like, may, maybe maybe Boone like sit him down in, in your office. Like, hey, here here's what's happening to you today. Maybe explain the situation. I don't think it's a bad thing to communicate to your players about what's happening. Uh, even if they may not be your players for long, they may be still on the roster for the rest of the season also after something like this. So just be a nice human. Just be, just be, just be yeah. a good human. The other side of that is people are saying it's a business. It is what it is. Don't really need to give all, all that. You know, it's like, uh, you sit <laughs> a guy down in there. If you're getting traded or sent down to the minors or whatever, you talk to them. This is a life I don't change. think it hurts. I don't think it hurts. I think it's. I think it's a. I think it's a, a, a thing that you can do. Like it's, Harrison Bader, yeah, he's a professional making millions of dollars. He's also going to have to move cities very soon. So maybe tell him he's going to have to do that, right? So, but there has just been a bevy of waiver activity before the August thirty first deadline. Uh, Renfro was also claimed by the Reds. Giolito, Lopez, and more all claimed by the Guardians. Um, Donaldson, who was put out on waivers, was uh, no nobody's picked him up, uh, but the Brewers were showing some interest, and then Randall Gritchick uh, also was waived. So uh, this year, because there is no waiver deadline, um, trade deadline, no waiver trade deadline, you put a guy out on waivers, and if someone else picks him up, they take on that salary, and he is added to that roster. And the reason it's all happening today is because in order to be eligible for the postseason roster, you have to add a player by September 1st to your uh, to your roster. So that's why we're seeing a lot of this activity this last week of August before. Um, but also a lot were... of circumstantial reasons why it's happening, too, because of the, 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 the way that the trades went down with the Angels, the amount of players. And now that they're completely out of it, you just don't see it very often where where teams make make runs at something. And then this this far away from the end of the season, they realize they're out of it. So they're able to do such a thing, right? Like the angels in the past, let's say a team like the angels went out and makes those, makes those trades. They're probably still nine out of 10 times. That team is still in the running, you know, with, with a couple of weeks left in the season and they can't possibly do this. So there was a, there was an unusual circumstance with the, with players getting out. And then even before, like the, the biggest difference is the fact if they do go through waivers, um, you don't have the ability to make any trade. So now the waiver priority becomes that much more important for doing jockeying certain ways. We were talking about, I'm scratching my head a little bit and why the guardians made the claims that they did, but they also were able to be ahead of the twins who were putting in a claim for said players and five games for that division. That's possible. You could make that. I don't know how many games they I'm have. I'm pretty to, sure the guardians made up about that, uh, that m- many games on the twins last September. Yeah. Didn't they? So, them adding some pitching, them adding like Giolito and uh, and and Lopez, and they're they they are significantly making their team better. Probably staying under thresholds, I would assume. I haven't looked at their luxury tax situation, but knowing Cleveland, I would assume that that would still keep them under a, a particular level. So them paying a little bit of money at the end of the uh, at the end of the year for you know significant talent to make up five games and completely screw the Minnesota Twins, kind of like it, kind of like it. I think it's an it interesting happen- savvy move. Yeah, it used to happen all the time uh, back when the Yankees and the Red Sox in the early 2000s. The Red Sox would always put in claims or you'd even see like Baltimore or Toronto put in claims. So the Yankees and the Red Sox couldn't get guys, even though those teams were really not in the playoff race. A lot of um, a lot of screwing over of other teams would happen that way. Uh, but when there was an actual waiver trade deadline, you would have to you would have a certain amount of time to if that guy cleared waivers to then make a deal with the team or else he ends up back on your roster. That's why sometimes you would see big name, big money players be put on waivers because teams were like, yeah, maybe a team will just take this money off of our hands. It happened with well, they, they also know that they also know that they will clear waivers, right? And right. then they'll have the ability to negotiate a trade potentially, which that doesn't exist anymore. So that was the other piece. Like they, like if that were still a thing, the Yankees could put uh, Giancarlo on, they could, they could have done it also, but it wouldn't, it would have been bad. It would have been bad optics, but they, if there were a trade deadline uh, for waivers, then they would have the ability to negotiate trades afterwards. And that's just not the case anymore. So the reason, well, they did it with Bader. 
Uh, I think that's an indication that he is not going to be re- re-signed in the offseason. But obviously, they'll still have the ability to do that. Uh, Harrison Bader uh, obviously has not had a good year uh, this year. He's got a 640 OPS in 63 games, uh, which is actually significantly worse than his career average. But what this also does is it saves a million-ish dollars off the luxury tax for the Yankees. Um and they have been right up against that top tax threshold. So they could be making some moves here, not only to clear 40-man roster spots to get guys up, but also saving a little extra money to make sure they're under that top tax threshold. Yeah, the um, it's interesting. It's just, and th- I think, you know, one of the bigger, the fact that they have to clear space, obviously they... Uh, they also released the, um, the the player that they traded for who got hurt in AAA. He was really just a depth piece, um, completely missing his name right now. But I don't think anybody needs to know that guy's name. But uh, that, that was the second piece that they actually traded along with Middleton and also a release. But again, like that guy was more of a depth piece. Like that was just speaks to the lack of activity that Cashman had at the trade deadline that him, this guy being the second piece, otherwise we would never have talked about it. It would have just been a transaction, you know, on the, on the wire and, uh, and have gone into, into space. Yeah. Spencer Howard. So, um, yeah, it's just, it's, it's interesting how they're, how the waivers this year really took an interesting turn with the circumstances that it did specifically with the, with the angels really and how they were able to release some significantly high players and only on one-year deals. That's the, that's the kicker, right? If it's multi-year deals, you're probably not seeing these guys getting uh, picked up or even waived at that point. What are your thoughts now on the Harrison Bader, Jordan Montgomery trade? I mean, pretty much what we thought it was originally. It was a, it was never really a great trade. It was always a, a, a puzzling trade when you give up a, a very solid starting pitcher and one Montgomery has been fantastic since he left. Uh, so you traded a, away a guy that was probably getting to the prime of his career, uh, probably just entering the prime of his career. And I know he's been bouncing around a little bit. Would love uh, the entertaining him coming back. I would absolutely entertain him coming back. Uh, but that's it's an a interesting, bad trade, man. Hold on. It's a bad trade. Inter- that's an interesting thought is re-signing Jordan Montgomery after he has been coached by some other organizations. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you – He's going to, that is going to be a conversation that will be a conversation. So well, it's a, the, they, they, the, the Bader, the Bader Montgomery trade is interesting, right? Because it first happened and we're like, wait, you just traded away a pretty solid starter for a guy that's not going to play until September. And then Bader had an amazing postseason for the Yankees and everyone's like, cash God did it again. And then Bader goes on the IL to start this season, comes back is super hot in the first week and a half. He comes back. People are all are all fired up for, for Harrison Bader as the future center fielder of the New York Yankees. And then he just completely fizzles, fizzles out from there. Like he's been very bad this year, offensively worse than even, even if he had just been, what he was in St. Louis, which is a league average hitter with elite defense. Okay. You can live with that. He's been terrible offensively. Yeah. And you start comparing, you start comparing guys like that with the numbers that we've seen from Harrison Bader to what uh, a guy like Esteban Floriel. And I'm not talking about our top prospects. I'm talking about a guy that's been, you know, off the prospect list for a long time now and has not really uh, made it in, into the, the major leagues and had success. But frankly, you put up like offensive numbers from him staying in as long. I bet they would be not that far off and he can play really good defense as well. So what's the point in signing a player like that at that point? You, you, there's no point. There's no point. There's no upside. When you have no upside with a player, I don't understand what you're doing uh, over with a long-term contract. Well, I, I think they believed there was more upside with Bader that they could. No, I'm talking about it. for the future. Yeah, yeah. But no. looking looking forward when when you're you're seeing a guy like that and then you have uh the available um pieces if they're going in the minor leagues to fill that position it's really not that big of a difference the discrepancy is not much and the upside is with a a guy like Dominguez coming in what a just a complete botch job Cashman did with the outfield this year for the Yankees he went into this season with Judge obviously and Bader and Hicks, two giant question marks because of health and performance and Stanton, who you can't, you can't rely on to be an outfielder. That was what they, this team went into for an outfield unit. That's, that's terrible roster management. 
Yeah, it is. It's bad. There's nothing else to be said about that. It's bad. And IKF, bad who was your shortstop last year. He wasn't even who, an option not, at that this point. This is not shitting on IKF. He's been a valuable u- super utility player for you this year. But come on. That's what you go into a season you're expected to win a championship in with an outfield? It That's wasn't even expected that, that IKF was going to play the outfield at that point, though. I, it IKF, was out of necessity. He had IKF to do it out, out of necessity. necessity said, raised his hand and said, I could play the outfield. And, and they, they put him out there and, and he held it down uh, in, a, in an admirable way out there. I and mean, they played pretty good defense, actually. So, oh, Oswaldo Cabrera as well, who's what we've yeah. learned is just a quad A player. The, yeah, the Yankees can develop quad A players. Like, they're pretty good at developing that. Maybe there'll be a new league developed where, you know, you get relegated and then you can win a World Series. You can win a quad A World Series. <laughs> I still don't understand that whole thing. Like, why, why are you getting excited about a minor league championship if that's actually what it is when you're not in a big league in soccer? I don't quite understand that whole thing. Different podcast. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Talking about? Hold on. What are you talking about? Oh, when like you get in, regu- in, when you, in the, when you get uh, from like uh, European soccer, you get relegated. Yeah. And then it's like yeah. you win in the lower league. I don't know. Because oh, yeah, if you cool. win, you can, get, you can get bumped back up. Okay. It's still, you still suck. You're still last place and you got sent down, Would right? Would you rather like it's... first place in the shitty league or last or last place in the good league? I guess you'd rather be last place in the good league, right? Yeah, I want to be. I want to have the opportunity to, to compete for a title in the good league. But if that's you're last place in the good league, then you get bounced down to the shitty league. I mean, that's just that's like saying this year, let's go play triple A and feel good about that. It's it's not no. <laughs> well, there was a point in the season the Yankees would have been spanked by some triple A teams. Yeah, probably. So oh, yeah, right. the the whole wa- the whole waiver thing, man, was uh, is is really interesting, and I think we finally have some excitement. And you know, even looking at what's what's happening on the roster, I know we talked about this in the last episode, but there have been uh, more developments because they've been playing more more games and succeeding with Severino and uh, uh, with Michael King actually pitching Severino pitching well. And I understand it's against Detroit. I don't really care. I just need to see him again. He goes back to back. Has the has the you know what you this know, is the you know what this is it. all leading up to you know what this is leading up to finishing strong for Severino yeah. everyone gets that twinkle in their eye about That's oh great. there's there's the Cy Young Severino Incentives. that we all incentive yeah. laden contract yes okay yeah we'll have this you know, the the new segment that we were talking about make the case is is the opportunity where we will be able to go in and debate these these types of players and and you know what it would mean for the Yankees to either sign them or not sign them and look elsewhere. So I think that's going to be, I'm excited for that because I think there's some, some interesting arguments uh, to be made on both sides, actually. But I think it's, yeah. uh, it'll be a fun exercise. The extremely frustrating thing about Severino is like, obviously he's got the talent to be a, a good pitcher. That was never in question. And they just needed it from him since June when he returned and he was awful for three straight months. And this team got buried, not all because of him, partially because of him and his 70 RA, but it's like, yeah, now you're seeing, it's like, did he figure something out? Is he facing shitty opponents? Is, is he relaxing now because the team is finally out of it? And maybe he knows he's going to be signing elsewhere in the offseason. I don't know what the answer is. All I know is it's annoying because of course he has the ability to do this. That's why we're frustrated. I don't think it's not like he's turning it on and off when he chooses. This is something that he had to work through obviously. And doesn't seem like the coaching staff was much help for him. Seems like it, it, it took uh, as long as it needed to for him to fix mechanical flaws. And that's probably just more reps and more reps and more reps and, and just doing the thing, uh, you know, countless times to, to find the, the right release point, to find the right mechanics, to find the right things. So I'm just glad he's healthy. I'm glad he's having fun and, and throwing the ball well uh, because you can see it. And, and when you have a loose Severino out there, you see, you see why we have that twinkle in our eye because the guy does have all the talent in the world. And then Michael King, you're looking at him, you know, getting stretched out again. Is another this... dude where you see the you see the potential, you see the uh, the ability it, with him if he's able to put it together and, and really be sustainable through six seven innings. If that's a, if that's a real thing and he's able to sustain the the stuff that he has over an extended period of time, he came up as a starter uh, um, and you know has been used in the bullpen, obviously. But if he's if he is able to do that and and you know, this is a guy that, that will be on the Yankees. That's a huge deal because I do believe that they're able to find pieces for the bullpen that can, you know, take that, that spot that, that he has, uh, that he has been in, as we've seen, it's much harder to find and develop and much more expensive to have starting pitching. That's effective and that can help you out. Hopefully King can be instructed this off season and the Yankees can just make the decision. 
work as if you're going to be a starting pitcher next year. Yeah. Like, like don't, don't have it be ambiguous, right? Like maybe he'll start, maybe he'll be an opener. Maybe he'll be a swing man. No, let's see if he can be a starter next year. Give him a month run at the start of the season. Give him a two month run. If it doesn't work out, move him back to the bullpen. I think at this point, what they're showing is that that is exactly what's going to happen. If they were to pivot from him stretching out and going into the off season with the mentality that he's competing for a starting position, I think that would be par for the, again, like probably back to precedent with what they did with Ian Kennedy and, and Phil Hughes and Jabba Chamberlain exactly. and, and all of these other guys, but which is, you know, a similar regime from the top. Um, but that needs to change. A guy like Michael King should absolutely be going in especially the way that they've been handling this last month with him. He, they're, they're clearly giving him an opportunity to be a starting pitcher. So go Good. in with that. You're absolutely right. Be, 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 you know, very defined in what your expectations are for him in the off season so that he can prepare himself. He can be under the tutelage of whoever he needs to be, but from a starting pitcher perspective, like that needs to be ingrained into his brain again. And, and he needs to be the best starting pitcher he can possibly be rather than being the best pitcher he can possibly be. And let's all be you know, realistic about his ceiling as a starting pitcher. It's probably a back end of the rotation guy, which is what they got out of Clark Schmidt and Domingo Herman before Herman got suspended this year, right? Like that's, there's still value in that, especially at a cheap contract like Michael King will be on. So I'm totally in favor of it. Also, like you said, they have been able to find bullpen pieces to, um, to get by, to, 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 to contribute well in the bullpen. King was excellent for the most part over the past two seasons in his, would you call him like a fireman role in the bullpen? I, I mean, he's changed. I feel like it's, it, it hasn't been consistent. So I don't know. He's just a, a guy that's coming and throwing two innings, yeah. one inning. So, it, there's been no consistency with any of it. So, and that's partially because there's no, there's no defined ninth inning guy. Uh, there's no defined spots within this, this, this bullpen. Uh, they've been just kind of utilizing it. At, at, with different pieces at different times. So it's hard to say Swiss army knife is your, your term. Stick with that. And Glaber has also been having a great, uh, a great series in a massive month of August. He's hitting yeah. in the month of August, 340 with over a thousand OPS. Um, really, we dropped some numbers in here. He's only had one bad month this season, June. He was bad, but every other month he was, you know, July, he was pretty average, but then he was, he was good in, the first two months of the season and he's been amazing in August as well. He's another guy we're going to talk about in that segment because he's entering the final year of his arbitration uh, next season. So he's going to be playing for a big free agent contract. He's going to be what? 28 years old when he hits the free agent market, 27, 28 years old. So that's right. In that, right in that prime. That's going to be a big topic for you and I to argue about. And I think we know what side each of us are going to be on. Um, but I think we're both on the same page right now. You let Glaber go into that walk here and prove it because what do you have to lose at that point? Sometimes that's a good thing, you know, and especially with a team that is, uh, he'll be 28 years old. Logan put it in the chat, he, you know, with a, with a team that, that needs uh, some fire under their ass, need some, you know, play in the moment right now is, is what matters. And only right now is what matters. A, a guy playing for a contract is a good thing. A guy with talent playing for a contract is a good thing. Let's hope that um, they're not scared by what happened with Aaron judge last year, right? Where they uh, didn't sign him early. And then he had a historic season. Not that Glaber Torres is going to hit 62 home runs next year, but you know, what if he repeats this season and then, and then you might be uh, overpaying for him. Anyway, that's another topic for another day. Thank you guys so much for listening. And of course, thank you to game time and athletic greens for sponsoring us today. Scott, any last words? Middle of the seventh inning Yankees are losing three, nothing to Detroit. Well, the people listening already know the result of that game. I'm just telling you where we are. Got it. Have a I fantastic apologize weekend. For my voice and coughing and sneezing and blowing nose. I've been sick for 10 straight days and being on vacation is not, making you know not getting me any better so hopefully next time i talk to you i won't be coughing into the microphone we'll talk to you in a few days